Hello and welcome to the Page and Stage podcast, where we explore the art and craft of writing and performance. I'm your host, Jason Cannon. This podcast is made possible solely through the support of listeners like you. So if you enjoy this show, I encourage you to do two things. First, tell even just one other person. Word of mouth has always been and will always be the best marketing tool in the world. And second, visit pageandstage.art. That's pageandstage.art and click support. You'll then be able to make a donation that helps to cover the cost of producing this podcast or even become a backer and set up a monthly recurring donation. Thank you for listening and thank you for your support. My guest this week is award-winning playwright, librettist, Fulbright specialist, and professor of musical theater writing and playwriting, Deborah Brevoort. A smattering of the accolades from Deborah's wide-ranging career include receiving the Campbell Opera Librettist Prize, the New Jersey Council on the Arts Playwriting Fellowship, twice, the Performing Artist Writer Fellowship from the American Antiquarian Society, the New York Foundation on the Arts Playwriting Fellowship, and the National Theater Conference Paul Green Award for Musical Book Writing. Deborah's plays, musicals, and operas have been performed worldwide and she has taught musical theater writing and playwriting in the graduate programs at NYU, Columbia University, and at the NBO Musical Theater Initiative in Nairobi, Kenya. And as if all that weren't enough, she was even a mover and shaker chief of staff for an Alaskan congressman. And yes, you better believe I ask her all about that story. Here we go with my conversation with Deborah Brevoort. And I am just pleased as punch to be sitting opposite the screen with Deborah Brevoort, who I got to work with a few times in the last few years. I'm in Sarasota. She's in New York, Magic of Technology. Deborah, thank you so much for joining me today. Well, it's great to be here and it's great to see you again. Yeah, it's been way too long. So I did a little peek at your Instagram. I don't know how active you are. I don't, I don't, it didn't seem to be all that active, but there was I, one I'm post. I'm never on Instagram. I don't know. <laughs> well, then it's someone masquerading as you and doing a very good job. But there was one post on there that I, that I resonated with. And that is, it was a, it was a little meme that said, everyone in our industry is paid more than the writer. And writer was listed off as playwright, composer, librettist. And I'm, I'm going to use this to springboard into some bigger issues, but okay. what, inst- what instigated necessarily that post for you, if you even recall posting it? I don't recall posting it, but I do, you know, I do post a lot of stuff on Facebook and I think they're linked. I think my stepkids li- linked those accounts for me. I never go on Instagram, but I think that meme probably came about during the writers, during the writer's strike. Of course. L- last fall. And I've also uh, have been really surprised at how many people, and I'm talking about the theater now, not uh, because I I don't work in film and TV, that that's what the strike was about, but how few, few uh, fellow artists in the, in the theater really understand the pay structure for playwrights or should I say a lack of a play structure for (laughs) playwrights because by way of, you know, informing your audience when a, when uh, a theater says they want to produce a play, the playwright is expected to come to rehearsals, especially if it's a first production. They're expected to be there, but the playwright doesn't get paid. Right. You get you get no payment. You you get an advance when they sign the contract or give you the contract for the production. You get an advance against royalties, which means that I'll get a check for two thousand bucks or something like that. But then that two thousand bucks is applied against the percentage of the box office which you get in your contract, which is not a large percentage. And so you end up being the lowest paid in the theater, but you are expected to be there all the time. And so that, I mean, that's just the way that it's, it's set up. And the reason for that is that the playwright holds the copyright and the copyright and the, and the, the work product, the play is something that I actually own. And so basically I'm renting it to a theater company to do. That's essentially what the arrangement is. And so, you know, they're paying rent on the property, so to right. speak. Yeah, but it's it's really more than rent because as a playwright, you want to be there and you want to caretake and you want to participate, you want to collaborate. And so, you, you know, you're spending weeks without any pay caretaking for this thing you've created. So, yeah, that, that's the way play, playwrights are paid or not paid. Not yet, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> 
that post didn't surprise me. So much of what you do skews political. And in conversation with you, I've noticed this, and I actually didn't know until I did some research for this podcast that you got your BA, one of your degrees is in political science, and that you spent late 70s, early 80s actually working in Alaskan politics. And I would just love for you to kind of nutshell that for us. Like, what drew you into politics? How did you get that job? What was your job like? And then how did you pivot from political work into artistic writing work? Sure. Well, I have a BA in political science. I also have a master's degree in political science. And I I was an LBJ intern in Congress back in the late, late 70s. And how I got into Alaska politics is it's a crazy story. It's all, it's like a movie script that you wouldn't believe. But <laughs> I moved to Alaska and I had no money. So I was waitressing. I was a barmaid in one of the hotels in Juneau. And the lieutenant governor's office was sitting at the table and started talking to me. And they found out that I had a master's degree in, in political science. Now, these were the heady frontier days of Alaska right after the pipeline. It was an undeveloped state. They said to me, I'm serving the drinks. And they're they're like, you have a master's? And they said, well, sit down. And then they said, come in and talk to us in the morning. And the morning I went in and had an interview and I was hired as a special assistant to the lieutenant governor of Alaska. I mean, that literally wow. happened. That was not an uncommon story in Alaska. So I went right into doing that kind of work. And when we lost the election, I then bounced to the, to the legislature and was an aide to uh, an Eskimo senator who was chair of the Finance Committee in the Senate, and I did a lot of work like that. But during my spare time, I became involved with this group of Alaskans who were trying to start a theater company. It's what is now today Perseverance Theater, which is the state theater of Alaska. Um, And it was Molly Smith who went on to be artistic director at Arena Stage. And I just was spending all my evenings and all my weekends sort of, you know, it was, it was, just a group of people trying to do theater. You know, we took over a bar, we turned it into a theater and you know, we're in the wilderness, literally. There's more bears on the island that I lived on than people. And <laughs> oh, so everybody did everything. It didn't occur to me until much later that it's better than any graduate education in theater, you know, was the experience that I had because I did everything. I started mm-hmm. acting. I was stage managing. I was helping to sell the costumes. I was raising the money. I was cleaning the toilets. I was yep. you know, everything. And then we turned into a professional theater and I became the producing director because I really understood the state finance process because I worked for the Senate Finance Committee and I understood of course. Yep. how to lobby money out of legislators, which I did very successfully and got the theater established financially and built it eventually into a million dollar a year theater company, which back in the 80s was a lot of money. (laughs) Yeah. And then I became the art lobbyist, the arts lobbyist for the whole state of Alaska. I represented all arts groups with the legislature. But my real love was the theater. And I was working in the theater, but I became the political face of the arts community in Alaska with the uh, intersecting with the political world. Interestingly, I went back and worked in the legislature from 2007 to 2010 because, and I I won't go into the big story, I was eligible for lifetime health insurance if I completed a contract I had signed in 1978, which I did. did. And I, I went back to Alaska for a production of the Women of Lockerbie at the University of Alaska. And when I let it be known that I needed to come back to the state to fulfill this requirement, my friends who I worked with were now the senators. My former boss wow. was Obama's chief of staff. That Whoa. Time. And I stopped by my friend, the, now the senator's office. I said, hey, I'm tier one. I'm eligible for the health insurance. And he's like, we've had such a brain drain up here. Will you come back? I said, yeah. And he said, and he took me over to campaign headquarters and said, we think these people are going to win. And we need, and we have newbies coming in. And you understand politics, will you come back and be chief of staff for one of these guys? And I said, if they win. And I said, absolutely. And the day I I followed the election returns, the day after I got a phone call from this wonderful man who is a beloved friend, a plumber who got elected. So the day after the election, I, you know, I get the phone call from Bob Book, who's now a beloved friend, who 
was a plumber who got elected to the legislature and he didn't know anything about politics. I was hired as his chief of staff and I went back and worked for him and for the Democratic caucus for four years during the Sarah Palin years. And wow. um, to your your bigger question about, you know, how how does that lead to theater? Well, politics is theater. <laughs> it's just a different kind of stage. So I would do I did a lot of political speech writing and that's really a monologue. And ah. for for my boss, who was, the, you know, the um, he was sort of like the everyman guy who, you know, was it Mr. Smith goes to Washington kind of character. He's, he's about the plumber who down to earth, no nonsense guy. That was a persona. That was a character. And so I thought this is this is playwriting gold. So I created his persona through his speeches and I wrote him daily. I wrote weekly editorials for him for the statewide newspapers in his voice. I just listened to the way he talked. And it was, you know, it wasn't me. It was in his voice. He was the most successful freshman legislator in the history of the state of Alaska, largely because I knew how to help him pick the bills to sponsor. And then I knew how to cloak him in the kind of folksiness that got them passed and in with the kind of speeches that grab the headlines. It's all theater. You you need to know the timing. You need to know how to deliver things verbally. You need to know the use of humor. I mean, everything you do is a playwright. So I just, I, I sort of looked at that work as playwriting up for a different kind of stage, which it was. And so I stayed for four years and I got my health insurance and then he left the legislature and I came back but I only work for four months a year. They, they they only have a legislature that only runs for, you know, from January to mid-April. So, you know, I just would go up there for a couple of months and I would do this work and I got my health insurance and was very well paid and actually got to do a different kind of playwriting. <laughs> what a different kind of playwriting, right? When you think of creating this persona and writing these monologues, you're not in control of the plot, though. You're, you're kind of in a place of reaction to what's going on in the news cycle and to which bills come up. And there's never truly that final climax or final act. Or is there? In, in that exercise, was it more an exercise in character and dialogue than in plotting? Or were you able, were you attempting to control the plot as well? No, you, you're trying to control the plot because, and see, that was the expertise that I brought to him. Because I understood the political process. I understood right. how to move things. I understood when to move forward, when to hold back. I, I, I really understood that process because I had not only been a staffer there for many years in my prior career, but I had been a lobbyist. So I, I knew about the timing of things. I also knew what got attention. Right. And, and I knew how to write things in a way that would be read. The, his columns were not didn't sound like they came from some policy wonk it was right. in his language and so i i basically knew how to grab the spotlight that that was the theater part of it for him and it worked you know and i also knew you know of course look every legislator comes in they're going to change this they're going to change that and i sat him down i said no you're not <laughs> <laughs> you know we're going to pick one thing okay one I thing think. And we're going to do that one thing and knock their socks off with it. So let's wow. find that one thing. And then it began, you know, you know, all of these ideas. And and so I found that thing for him and he jumped on it. And it just it just was like wild. I mean, people really took to it. It was about um, I don't know, even if you know about this, there was this thing called Internet hunting. Have you heard about this? Internet hunting? Internet hunting. Yes. So what you can do, you can go onto a website and you pay somebody, uh, you, you hook up your webcam and your computer to a gun that is on a real preserve and you can sit and in your pajamas and hunt big game. In Colorado, you can shoot buffaloes, you can shoot whatever. Wait, so mm -hmm. there's there's not a person holding the gun. It's like it's it's a gun on a system that can fire when there's you control a gun it, like, like a, a video game? Well, yes, except that you are hooked up by web to a real gun that is in a blind somewhere in Montana or California or Colorado. So you not have even, these... It could be anywhere, not even in your town or state. It could be anywhere. Oh, it's it's not in your town and state. So you what? have these, these preserves like in places like Texas and Colorado and out West 
where these people will will it will set up these guns and then through the web you control the gun and you shoot the animal. Holy moly. It's crazy, I've right? Never heard of that. I've never heard no, of you it. never heard of it. Well, this thing took off about 10 years ago and I thought now Alaska is one of the big game hunting places in the world, right? Right. And right. you know, I brought that to Bob and I said over my dead body, are they going to be shooting our polar bears and our grizzly bears and our moose? And Bob, right. being a hunter, was a plumber, was a hunter. And I'm like, put on your hunting clothes. OK, here we go. You know, <laughs> and we came out with the outrage over this thing, right. which was outrageous. Right. And we came out with the bill that was going to stop this. Nobody's going to be sitting in New York in their pajamas shooting out <laughs> big game. Everybody, Republicans, Democrats alike, loved it. The public loved it. The newspapers loved it. I wrote him a fabulous speech. He got up about we're Alaskans. We don't we don't hunt in our pajamas. You know, that kind of, <laughs> <laughs> I cut stuff. I mean, <laughs> other senators are turning around and looking at me like, "Oh my God, what did you do?" <laughs> this almost sounds like a Saturday live sketch. I mean, that is you just can't wild. make it up, right? <laughs> It went shooting through the Alaska legislature so fast, and it, it's now law. Nobody is wow. allowed to set up a, a big game hunting thing like that in Alaska. All right. So I have heard you say this is going to be interesting because all this political stuff, you believe that beauty is political. You believe that theater is political. But you are also very, very specific that political activism and theater don't go together. They don't mix. When a theatrical artist tries to be a political activist, it backfires and you lose the beauty. Or I'm, I'm kind of putting words in your mouth now, but I would love, Deborah, for you having just set us all up with, I was writing monologues for this character with a persona to protect our bears. <laughs> yeah. when, it, when it comes to political activism, theater, theater being political, unpack that for us. In your mind, how do all those things interweave and relate to each other? Well, the first thing I want to say is, no matter what you do in the theater, it's political. It just is, whether you want it to be political or not. But the reason why I, there's a lot of reasons why I'm, I'm opposed to political activism in the theater. First, when I sit down to write a speech for Bob Book about, you know, they're not coming for our bears in their pajamas, right? Right. Um, <laughs> um, I'm the 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 goal of my writing is to convince you of something. I have a viewpoint that I'm trying to persuade you to adopt, right? I'm trying to get you on board with my thinking. When I sit down to write a play, if I'm if I'm trying to do activism through plays, then I'm doing the same thing. And I don't believe that uh, well, I don't know about you, but you know, when I'm sitting in the theater and somebody's doing that, it really makes me mad. Because it's like, I'll yeah. do my own thinking. Thank you very much. Right. You are using art to control me. I will not be controlled. But more importantly, it doesn't have power. And so the thing about beauty that I've really come to realize, and I have to you know, stop and say that these are not all of my ideas. I have read the beautiful book called On Beauty by Elaine Scarry, which greatly influenced my thinking, and also The Gift by Lewis Hyde. The thing about beauty is, it awakens something in us. It awakens something that's invisible and that's powerful. And more importantly, whenever we encounter beauty, whether we're driving down the road and we see a snow-covered mountain or we see a beautiful rose or we meet a person who's beautiful or whatever, beauty creates, in, in, in addition to uh, making us feel alive and hitting us in the heart, because beauty doesn't hit us in the head. It's not a thought. It's not an idea. Right. It's, it's a right. sensation. It's a feeling. It's an enlivening that happens. It also awakens in us the ability, not the ability, the, the desire to replicate it. So, I mean, just think about you're walking down the, uh, driving down the street and, the, and Mount Kilimanjaro appears in front of you. You slam on the brakes, pull out the cell phone and take a picture of it. You duplicate right. it, right? <laughs> um, right. And... Or if you're a composer, uh, it inspires music. Or if you're a poet, you write a poem. And so beauty has a duplicative effect in the world. It, it unleashes something. And what it unleashes is, is very alive and vibrant and full of life. And, and, and to your point, 
has its own agency in a way. Everyone will interpret or duplicate in their own way. And if <laughs> if in a piece of theater, the playwright is telling you how to duplicate it, they're, they're squashing the power of the beauty. Yes, there is no beauty. It has no impact. I go, oh, I agree or I disagree. And I turn it off and I leave the theater and it has not moved me in any way. But beauty yeah. moves us in invisible ways. And this is the power of art, right? Because it can't, it's not, you can't control it. This is why authoritarians are always locking up writers and, and artists. Yeah. Because artists unleash something that is alive and that starts duplicating itself. And it sets something loose into the world that actually opens our hearts. And when our art, when our hearts are open, our minds are open, right? So I think that if you make your goal, for me being an opera writer and a theater writer, a playwright, if I find a really compelling story and I tell it, I write it really well and I tell it compellingly and I move people through feeling or laughter or beauty or humor, I'm shaking loose the human heart and setting something in motion that will be duplicated in some way, whether through conversation about it or whether through photographs or, and often what a, a writer will do. I mean, look, I know you're a writer, Jason. Writers are awakened to art by other writers. I started yeah. writing because I sat in a theater at ACT in San Francisco in the 1980s, and I saw this little-known play by Lanford Wilson called Angels Fall that was a total failure. People were leaving in droves, bad reviews. It went, it's never been produced. It, it went out of publication. But there was something so powerful in that play that it, it just it took my breath away. I can't even tell you what it is. I could weep just even right. thinking about it. And I stumbled out of that theater. I was probably the only one. I stumbled out of that theater <laughs> not knowing what hit me. And I felt compelled to meet the power of that work by putting something powerful of my own into the world. And that was when I started to write. And so art awakens that kind of stuff in people, that those feelings, those responses. And that is actually a humanizing and a very, very powerful thing. Whereas arguments, theories, political activist viewpoints, if anything, they arouse resistance. Resist. Yeah, I, I, I was literally going to say that word if you didn't. <laughs> yeah. So there's that. There, and also to jump to like Václav Havel, the playwright turned president of the, Czech, of the former Czechoslovakia. Now, Václav Havel was the nation's leading political activist. Right. He was also the nation's leading playwright. And he was adamant that you do not mix politics with plays. And the reason that they locked him up was, and his plays were about joy, bad luck, eternity. They were funny. They were, you know, they weren't, they had no political purpose. I mean, they had a huge political impact. He liberated the country from the Russians with his right. use of his plays. But his plays were about non-political things. But they gave life to a country that was under a totalitarian regime and unleashed something so powerful that it resulted in the overthrow of the, you know, the breaking down of the, of the, it, the Berlin Wall fell and then the Velvet Revolution and yeah. then Eastern Europe was liberated from the Soviet Union. And it was because he wrote works that were artistically penetrating. And it was that, 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 that penetration that, that set people, that made them feel alive and set them in motion in a different way, which resulted in a huge political consequence to it. I'm not saying theater is not political. I'm saying it's totally political, but you can't make that your your aim. And I guess the last thing I would say about that is that it, Paula Vogel, who was my teacher, you know, said, always would say to me, don't put your ideas into words because then they can be dismissed. Ah. Put, put your ideas into the structure because then they will be, they will be experienced. So like a very simple illustration of this is the way in which we craft a, a well-made play. You introduce a character. doesn't matter who that character is. They want something. They want it desperately. They have a problem, right? 
It could be Sweeney Todd who wants revenge. They don't necessarily have to want something good, right? They could, right? You know, of course, they, not, they, yeah. they just need they need something. They have a big problem, and you set them on, into the obstacle course of a play, and an audience is immediately going to root for them. So how did I how did I use that? I wrote a play called The Poetry Pizza, which is an Arab American love story, and it, I wrote it during the surge of Iraq when we were at war. Yeah. We, you know, we were killing Arab men overseas. We were, it was after 9-11. Uh, we were treating them horribly here in the country. They were greatly maligned. And I thought, well, what's the most, I, I'm going to write a, a romantic comedy about an American woman who falls in love with uh, an Arab pizza maker. And I, <laughs> I am going to write this Arab pizza maker. He's illiterate. She's a university professor. I'm going to seduce the audience. I'm going to make the audience fall in love with this guy in the way that she falls in love with him. And I mean, I, I had people really get intermission, like, oh my God, where's the Saran in my life, right? You know? And I, I thought, there's my political comment. I don't have to say anything. If, am I going to gnash my teeth about racism and racial profiling? Who wants to listen to that? I don't want to listen to that. And who's going to come to, a, to the theater to hear that? Nobody. But will they come for a, a really funny romantic comedy, romantic farce? about people who make fools of themselves when they fall in love with the wrong people. Everybody does that, right? I guess I also don't expect that my plays are going to change the world. There's no play that's going to change, I mean, going to change the situation. But I do like to think that people of any political viewpoint and lots of different political viewpoints saw lots of productions of that play and that they were rooting for the Arab guys, right? <laughs> Right. Um, yeah. You know, my only goal was to create something of great humor, great beauty that would sort of awaken something in the heart, some humanity in the heart. That's what beauty does. And that's what's powerful and political about it. Hey, this is Jason, and we'll get right back to the show. But I wanted to let you know that Page and Stage is way more than this podcast. If you go check out pageandstage.art, that's pageandstage.art. You'll find a weekly newsletter full of tips, tricks, encouragement, and inspiration for storytellers of all stripes. You'll also find the online bookshop for Ibis Books, which is the publishing wing of Page and Stage. And if you're working on your play, novel, memoir, or speech, you can even set up some one-on-one -on -one story coaching with me. Again, that's pageandstage.art. And now back to my conversation with Deborah Brevoort. Deborah, I want to stick with politics for just a little longer before I move on to something else. On your uh, CV and your resume, it says you are a Fulbright specialist through the U.S. State Department for yeah. theater, musical theater, and opera. What does that mean? <laughs> well, well, this is a brand new thing. And I have, you know, I've done a lot of work internationally and I continue to work internationally. And my friends who I know through international theater have been encouraging me to do this for a long time. And I, I just retired from Columbia University and I'm going on sabbatical at NYU. So I thought this is a good time to try to do the Fulbright thing. So what the State Department, there's lots of different Fulbrights. I'm sure everybody who's listening has, has heard of the Fulbright. You know, there's Fulbright scholarships for students. There's Fulbright right. fellowships for faculty members. But they have this thing called the Specialist Program where they maintain a roster of folks in different, different disciplines, you know, agriculture, you know, and they actually have one for the arts, for writers. and wow. They have them for engineering and biology and, you know, every field. They have, they have this roster where they, they try to have a, an array of specialists. And then those specialists are available to go overseas on short-term projects when a host organization in another country, often a university, but not always, could be a theater, could be an opera, could be, it could be any, an NGO, whatever. They, they need something or they want to do something but they don't have the expertise for it. And so they file an application with the U.S. embassy in that country. And okay. then the embassy will send it to Washington. And if you are a specialist in the area that they want, then you're hooked up with them. And, and then you go over and do these short-term projects from two to four weeks or maybe two to five weeks, I think it is. So I have just, I've, I was just placed on this like in the last month. It's brand new. 
Um, oh, wow. <laughs> and, and in fact, tonight I'm having a conversation with South Korea who wants to bring me over to do a musical theater workshop sort of on the order of this project that I did in Kenya a couple of years ago. I don't know if I ever told you about that, but I went over with Fred Carl, who is a composer that I teach with. There was a group in, in Kenya who realized that they have an enormous resource in the music of that country. Uh, East Africa is the musical worlds over there are amazing, but they don't have theater. And so they thought, oh, we need to develop new Kenyan musicals that are based in our music, Afrobeat, you know, our musical tradition yeah, that yeah. tell our stories with our writers. But we don't know how to do that. You know, they have the music, they have the writers, they have the stories, but they didn't know how to do the theater. They and don't so, know the structure. They don't. Yeah. Yeah. So they so they brought us over and the the host Eric Wanina, who's basically East Africa's leading pop star, he's sort of like I guess in our generation we'd say he'd be our Bruce Springsteen. He oh, wow. <laughs> so he handpicked ten writers and ten composers from all over the country and brought them together, and then brought me and Fred in, and we teamed them together, and we basically were teaching the one thing they didn't have. You know, they didn't need any right. musical instruction from us; they needed the theatrical instruction, and. So we right. ignited an entire musical theater movement over there. By the end of our workshop, people from all over Kenya started arriving, just showing up because they heard about the workshop. And our 10 musicals turned into 16. A most unbelievable day was the day that Obama's sister showed up. I'm like, what? <laughs> Obama's sister's downstairs. Could she come into your class? I'm like, I open the door. Sure. Why not? Okay. You know, um, and we, we did this for three or four years. And, you know, in the end, it settled down to about 10 musicals that have gone on to festivals around Africa. And we trained people there to carry on what we were doing. So, you know, we went back and we did Zoom for a year during the pandemic. We went back mm -hmm. twice, but we they now have a musical theater program over there oh, uh, wow. and new musicals that are going out in the world. So, I suspect that's why I got put on the Fulbright roster because right. that was a pretty amazing thing that happened. And there's lots of people in the world that want that. So, well, yeah, um, the, I mean, South Korea, gonna, the next K pop musical, Deborah Bevort. <laughs> no, the first K pop musical written by one of our students at NYU. Exactly. That, oh, really? Oh, oh, yeah. That whole team came out of our NYU program. They were our students. Oh. Yep. <laughs> You talked about working internationally, and there's a project you've been working on that's going to tour this year, I believe, that I am so curious about. Apparently, it's 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 called Blue Moon Over Memphis. Uh -huh. and it's about Elvis Presley, but it is written in the style of Japanese no drama and no spelled N O H. That's correct. Um, if you could, if you could just give the nutshell of what no drama is, and then how this project merging Elvis with Japanese traditional no drama came to be and what that tour is going to look like. What was that process like for you? What is that? This has been almost a 25 year long process for me. I studied the, the no drama in at Brown University when I was in graduate school. And in fact, Blue Moon over Memphis, the first version was my master's thesis. And then, <laughs> and so the no, uh, but there's, there's now different versions of the play. But the no drama, let me see in a nutshell, it's a highly stylized, it's sort of like Japanese opera. It's highly stylized. It's always about the ghosts of famous dead people who who reappear at, at a place where something traumatic has happened. And there's a pilgrim that, you know, it, it there's the same structure in every story. A pilgrim goes to the mountaintop on the night of the full moon, and then the ghost of the famous dead person uh, appears and then disappears with the coming of dawn. That's basically the structure of it. And it's an exploration of one emotion deeply and poetically and musically over a period of time. And it's built on music that's known to the audience. It's built on poetry and characters that are known to the audience done in a highly stylized manner. Let me say this, that I've been studying the no drama for 25 years and I am a novice. I mean, it's, yeah. that, it's that difficult, right? So when I was sitting in this class, I kept thinking, you know, how the heck would you do something like this in America? Because the whole goal is you take the audience into a meditative state. And I'm like, we're so action packed, you know, yeah. created the Hollywood, you know, action film. And no American audience is going to sit for this. And I kept thinking, well, how, how could I make this work in America? 
So I began searching for famous dead people. Well, I would come up with people like from the Bible or from folk tales, but I realized only a few people would know who this person was. And the thing about the no drama is it's a character that everybody knows. And I thought, man, yeah, universally this, known. Yeah. This huge country of ours. Do we have anybody that everybody knows? And moreover, do we have music that everybody shares? And I'm like, no, because we're all so segmented. Right. And then I don't know where I hit on Elvis Presley. And I, I remember going home and saying to my elderly mother, I said, I think I might have found my no subject. Do you know Elvis Presley? <laughs> no, I don't know anything about Elvis. And I put on a song. She goes, oh, she started singing along to it. I said, you know Elvis. Oh, you know Elvis. Yeah. I don't know you know him. And then I realized the Muzak in the grocery store was all Elvis songs. I called my friend. <laughs> I have an Eskimo seal hunter friend on the Bering Sea. And I called him and I said, Earl, you ever heard of Elvis Presley? And he cracked a joke. He said, would you see him in the grocery store, Deb? Because at that time, Elvis <laughs> and I didn't up. I said, well, if my right. friend in the Bering Sea and my elderly mother know Elvis, then I've got a character everybody knows. And then I realized that the, the Elvis music actually sort of formed the soundtrack of many of our lives when we were younger. And we all know those songs, mm. even if we don't know that mm -hmm. we know them. And so I realized I had the perfect no subject, that Elvis was an American no, and that the way I could take the American audience into the meditative state would be to build it on music that everybody knows and on gestures because Elvis has lots of gestures and no drama oh, of gestural, right? So I'm going to build it around all the Elvis iconography, the words, the song lyrics, the music, but I'm going to distort it and do it slow-mo and sort of try to, you know. So I created an Americanized no, which wow. was really, really successful. Well, then it got into the hands of a Japanese company who said, well, this is very interesting. You've created an American no. You want to come back to the Japanese and put it now into the Japanese form with Japanese music? And so wow. I then worked with a composer over there for a no orchestra, and it's a whole different version of the play. It's the traditional version. And it's actually been around for about five years. It toured to Los Angeles, and it's been to a few places in the U.S., and it's toured in Tokyo and Singapore. But now they're doing another, a bigger tour in, to in Tokyo and Kyoto this summer, and I'm going over for that. And the Waseda Foundation, who are the Uniqlo folks next door, the Uniqlo, they're bringing me over and They've asked me to do a lecture, which is appeals to pop culture, because Elvis is very big in pop culture in, yes. in, uh, in Japan, with the very traditional, it, it's sort of like bringing Elvis into the Met Opera House, I mean, in terms of the, the world, you know. So I'm going to yeah. create a, a lecture demonstration that smashes these two worlds together in a lecture to precede the performance. That's amazing. Best yeah. of luck with that. You mentioned that no was akin to Japanese opera. And opera is something you have been focusing on more and more in the last several years. You've been doing less straight theater and even less straight musical theater and a lot more opera. You even I even read once that you said something like, it feels like theater might have left me. Talk a little bit about how you got into opera and why it's been drawing you in more and more deeply. Well, the first thing is I didn't realize when I wrote Blue Moon Over Memphis, my no, no drama, that I had actually written an opera. I didn't realize yeah. that. Oh, later when I got into opera, it's like, oh man, I've actually been writing opera for a while, didn't even know it. So uh, I got into opera through the American Lyric Theater, which offered a free training program in New York. And in fact, applications for this program open today. They're for anybody in the country. It's free training, one-year training in how to write opera. And I got into the very first cohort that they put together because I wanted to turn my play, The Women of Lockerbie, into an opera. I always knew I wanted to do that, but I also realized I didn't know how to do that. I realized that opera writing is very different than playwriting and that I needed some skills, but I had no idea how I was going to get those skills. And then right. this program came along and I got into the program and I got the training and I'm sort of off to the races. And and now that I'm in the opera, I, you know, I realize I, I sort of have sort of always belonged there. I was just sort of the last person <laughs> to know it. And um, <laughs> it's very formal. It's very architectural and formal in that way. It's not naturalism. There's nothing naturalistic about it or realistic At all, about right. it. It's highly stylized. You get to work on a really large scale. 
There's mm. no such thing as lights up on the living room couch. There's no four character talkie plays. I mean, it, uh, the opera's big. You have yeah. huge orchestras, you have huge production elements, you have big voices. You're working at a at a large scale, which the American theater's not able to support, frankly. Yeah. The, with the small sets and the unit sets. So I got to work on a large scale. I have a natural, it, it's all architectural, which is something that is right in my wheelhouse. I really understand form. I when you say form. architectural, when you say architectural, Deborah, for some listeners out there who maybe are coming at, to opera for the first time this way, what, what do you mean by architectural? The libretto basically creates the skeleton for a large scale musical composition. So the libretto is doing what a play would do. You know, your character story, all that stuff. You're doing it in an extreme, an extremely economical manner, but you are doing it by creating an architecture of musical form. So the thing that you actually figure out, in addition to all that other stuff, character, story, theme, is the musical structure of it. So we're going to start with a chorus. We're going to go to recit to aria and then aria to duet. To, you know, you're, you're actually creating that. It's sort of like you're building the skeleton for an animal. And then the composer, uh. the composer puts the flesh on the bones, kind of. I mean, that's so right, that, right. that's what I mean by it. But it, it, it requires you got to use that part of your brain in a way you don't in playwriting or in musical theater writing. So I I I. I I, I don't know. I, I it, it fits me like a glove. It, I like that kind <laughs> of work. I do that well. I I really like the opera. I interestingly, it has a reputation for being very conservative. And in fact, when I first started writing opera, I could see the conservatism. It's funded by old rich people, and it's. But the opera has completely changed in the last ten years. The biggest growth in audience is young people. Young people are embracing it. Um, oh. Opera has thrown open the doors to new writers and new composers so that more contemporary music is sort of blending with the classical. And the, the new opera that's being done right now all over the country is spectacular. And actually, it's the stuff that's selling tickets, not the old war horses that they always Oh, the, the big old known titles aren't doing as well as the new oh, stuff now. Even the Met, the most conserv conservative of all, announced that going forward, there will be more new operas in their season than old operas. Why? Because the new operas are selling, right? So actually, I have found the, the, you know, the staid old conservative opera to be the most artistically open place and much more adventurous than the theater, much more willing to take risks. Mm -hmm. They are more willing to trust the artists. When you get commissioned, first of all, you don't sit down and write an opera and go out and sell it. You get an opera to commission you. It's um, almost always commissioned. It's always on the front end. 100%. If you write the opera, it will not get produced. You need to get into the community, demonstrate. You have to be on your game. There's a lot of money. It's a very expensive art form. I was you just going to say I mean? that's probably why, because the the risk is so much. You talked about the largesse, the scale. So, of course, they're going to want to hedge their bets. Yeah. So, no, you you have to, you know, you have to demonstrate that you can deliver what needs to be delivered and you can deliver it at a high quality and you can deliver it when it needs to be delivered. I mean, it's very, it's really rigorous. Like everybody in the opera is super rigorous. The singers, I mean, it's, it's crazy rigor, right? You know, and I like that about it. It keeps you on your game and you, you get yeah. better artistically because you're, you're in there with, with the best people. But when they, they commission you and they pay you really well, unlike the theater, Sorry. <laughs> they do. They pay you well. And then they get out of your way. Now you go in and you you get a couple of workshops. You know, you get to develop it and you'll get notes. Everybody needs notes, right? Um, yep. But the notes are never from a marketing perspective. I get so many notes in my work in theater that is really coming from the marketers. Well, if you do this, we can sell oh. right? the The art in opera is more pure. I mean, mm. I have never had a conversation in the opera where I have been asked to consider changing something because it would be more saleable to the audience. And the people in opera have a great, look, theater people love theater. Opera people crazy love opera. It's, <laughs> it, you know what I mean? It's beyond the pale. And, and that crazy love infects everything and it's wonderful. And 
if they've given you the commission, they assume that you know what you're doing and that you're yeah. the artist and they get out of your way and they let you do the work. And then when it comes time to develop, then, every, you know, it's collaborative. Everyone's changing and doing what you got to do to make it right, of course. But there's not that the marketing interference that you always get right. in the theater. And I find it very interesting that today, because theater and opera are both hurting very badly after the pandemic, of that the opera is not hurting half as much as the theater is. Opera audiences are going up and opera is faring much better than theater in post-COVID. and. I suspect it's because their their art is pure. I think at some level, audiences can smell that. Talk just a little bit, Deborah, about so you write operas, but you're the you're the the librettist, right? Mm -hmm. What's it like to work with a composer? Do you have input into the songs? You talked about the architecture and the structure. Do you when you tell the composer this is a duet, or does the composer come back to you? Is it is it highly collaborative from the start? Do you hand something off to the composer and they? finish it? What is that process like? Is it different based on who the composer is? In musical theater, you get writing teams, right? That That's kind right. of the famous uh, Rodgers and Hammerstein, Gilbert yep. and Sullivan, that kind of thing. Is it similar in opera or a different kind of working relationship? Completely different than musical theater. And musical theater, you and your composer basically write moment by moment together, weighing in on each other's work. That doesn't happen in the opera. What happens is you go through an extensive outlining process. And by outlining, I, I don't mean, oh, we'll sit down over the weekend and jot down a sketch of what the action's going to be. The outline is where the collaboration occurs. That's where the architecture is created. And that is the longest part of the process, weirdly. I will spend three to four months working intensely with my composer on that outline, and then I'll write a full-length libretto in three weeks' time. But I'll spend four to five months on the outline. And You're writing those that libretto without any idea of what the music sounds like? Or by that point, the, working with the, a composer for a few months, you have an idea what the music sounds like? No idea what the music sounds like. But you are creating that structure in collaboration because the composer knows, no, 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 we can't have three arias in a row. We, you know, we, we need to build it in this way. I'm, I need some dry rest in here. I need whatever. And so you get that outline together and then you, the librettist, go away and you write the first draft of your libretto. And then you come back to the composer and you usually do a, a reading of it with singers uh, and with the, with the commissioning company. And you, you get notes like you would at any reading about character, story, plot, all that kind of stuff. There's still not a lick of music that's written. And then you work with your composer. And when the composer says, I can work with this, then they go away. And it's not uncommon. Now, every composer is different, but it is not uncommon for your composer to go away for a year and you don't talk to them and then they come out of their <laughs> out of their wow. artist hovel with this score completely orchestrated and you sit down and hear it. Now, you usually you go through a piano vocal score first and yeah. then you get a workshop for that and you can make a few changes. But once you get to go to orchestration, there's no changes. You can't change. So you, the librettist, have to deliver a libretto in two drafts ready for production. There's no cool. back and forth like you have in musical theater or in playwriting. Now, some composers are more available and more back and forth. But I'll tell you the kind of back and forth is I, I have found messages on my cell phone. Hey, Deb, you know, in uh, scene two, the line is da -da 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 -da. that's only five syllables. I need seven and I need the last syllable to be an O or an A. So you got it's like, <laughs> That's amazing. Okay, that's okay amazing. so let me see. <laughs> It's very, very different. So that's that's basically how it's done. Deborah, that is, that breakdown of opera is so fascinating. I do want to ask you about one particular opera of yours. You've written mm -hmm. so many, but the one I, I really want to have the listeners learn about and possibly even go watch because it's available on YouTube is called The Knock. Now, The Knock, it's a story about military wives awaiting that awful knock on the door saying that something may have happened to their spouse overseas. And there's a whole story here with, I'm curious how this commission came to you. I'm curious about when COVID happened and you all had to pivot and make a film out of it, which I haven't got to watch the whole thing yet, but I've watched the first few minutes and it is, it's astonishing. The, the melding of the naturalism of film, interesting that earlier you said how 
totally not naturalistic opera is, but the marriage, the naturalism of film with this heightened score and singing beneath it is just so captivating. I encourage everyone to go. It'll be in the show summary, the link to the to the to the opera, to the movie version. But please tell us about the origin of the knock, the pivot into the film and what that project meant to you. Well, this is a this one's very near and dear to my heart. Back during the surge of Iraq, I was commissioned by Virginia Stage Company to come into the community and interview military wives and write a play about military wives. Oh, and wow. um, and so this project, which originally was going to be a one year project, turned into a three year project because the military community is very insular and very hard to penetrate. Right. So long story short, I was there in Norfolk for three years and and actually developed a lot of very close friendships and relationships and was able to get enough to write a play that is called The Comfort Team. And the play is out there. It was done at Virginia Stage, and it was wonderful and beautifully produced. But during these interviews with 43 military spouses from every class, from every region, from every race, religion, rank, from admirals' wives to the gunners' <laughs> wives, I heard many stories about the knock. And the knock refers to, th that's the colloquial expression for a death notification. The one thing you never want is the knock on the door. And I also learned a whole lot about, you know, sort of the way that, that military wives, you know, what their lives are like, which, you know, none of us know anything about this. But for example, I mean, and, and this is key to the knock, military wives are the most hooked up people in the world. They've got their cell phone, every, every room in their house, there's a TV station, they, oh, they're on boy. Skype at the time. They were on Skype with their husbands. They are in constant communication with their spouses on the war front. They have set times where they talk to get each other. You know, I mean, it's really, they're really hooked up. But every once in a while, the base will go on blackout. And it will go on blackout for any number of reasons. It could be a power outage. It could be because somebody's been killed. Or it could be strategically, they don't want any communications coming in because there's something going on. There's a whole host of reasons why they call it River City. The base is on River City. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, the commanding officer's wife back home gathers the families, the wives together because the military wants everybody in one place because panic starts to spread and rumors start to spread, right? As soon as they're right. on the backgrounds, oh my God, there's been a battle. And a lot of times there's not. It's, it's, it's the power went out or, you know, they're they're rebooting the computers or whatever, you know? So, but they always get the wives together until they know what's going on and then somebody comes and delivers the news. And so this is like a ritual that these poor people go through all the time. So I was told the story. The story of the knock is a story that I was told by somebody and it has haunted me for the last 10 years. And I just knew that this particular story, and I can say anything about it because it's, you don't, yeah, when don't, don't movie, spoil it. You think you know what the movie's about, but you don't. So, um, and that was part of writing us, you know, e even for people who know what the knock is, uh, you don't, you don't know what's happening in this opera. All you know is that the base is on blackout. The wives had been gathered together. And finally, an officer is sent to deliver the news. And so the whole opera takes place as the women are waiting for they don't know what. And this officer is driving. So it's all in his head and in their heads in between them. So this really haunted me. And so I actually now usually operas come to the company will go to a composer, say, we want we love your music. We want to write an opera. Do you have a librettist or we have a librettist who we like, who we, we'd like you to work with? That's usually how it happens. Libretta, librettists never originate work in the opera, never. But with this one, I chose the composer, a woman I trained oh. with. We, we trained together and I, you know, and I just kept, you know, for a couple of years I had this. I wrote out the treatment. I had it in my heart. I didn't know. I kept saying who, who, who. And then I realized it was Alexandra. And I went and had coffee with her and I said, I have this idea. And I just told her the story and she was in a puddle of tears. I said, I, I think mm -hmm. I chose the right. Unbeknownst to me, her parents were executed by the Nazis. They were resistance Oh, leaders. my God. They're the national heroes of Serbia. And she's from a military family who has dealt with all this stuff. I had no yeah. idea. So I said, OK, I'm going to go out and sell this. Well, librettists don't do that. But I went to Francesca Libre <laughs> Zambello at Glimmerglass. And I said, I have, I have a great idea for an opera. She goes, what do you have? She goes, and I'm like, read, read, read it, read it. And she calls me back. She goes, oh my God. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to commission you. <laughs> and we got commissioned. 
And she goes, this never happens this way. It never happens this way. I said, okay, so it happened this way. So, so we got the commission and we wrote it and we were supposed to premiere it in 2020 and we all know what happened in 2020. Yep. yep. Then we get scheduled for 2021. Everybody's assembled on the Glimmer Glass campus in upstate New York and COVID surge, state of New York oh, man. limits yep. the number of people who can be on the Glimmer Glass campus and our project got booted. And we were, the artists were there and Francesca oh. said, okay, we're making a movie. And I thought, what? <laughs> opera singers, opera singers are not known for their acting ability. And the director had never worked in film. And I'm like, you know, she said, I need a new libretto by Friday. I, it, it takes place in <laughs> Colorado. She says, we're filming it. Summertime, upstate New York. Change all the references. <laughs> you know, I'm like, <laughs> which I did. And it happened so fast. And. Then, then they create, remember they had bubbles, work bubbles. Right. Re okay. So there was a work bubble that was created for the knock a and knock I was, bubble. I was deemed non-essential. So I wasn't even allowed to be there. Oh no. Because <laughs> <laughs> so, they can only have so many people. They had the singer, they had the orchestra playing inside and the singers, because singing is the most dangerous thing to do in COVID. Of course. The, the viral surge, yeah. right? And so, so they yeah. had to put the singers outside standing underneath a window listening to the orchestra practicing their music. I mean, it was wow. It was crazy. It was just crazy. And I just th said, well, this is like a Hail Mary pass. I I, I just thought I, I I couldn't see how this was going to work. And then Ryan McKinney, who is a, a very famous opera singer, he sang the role of the killer in Dead Man Walking at the Met. I mean, oh. he's very esteemed. He runs a little video film company on the side, and he basically makes money by doing back of theater videos of opera shows. I mean, everybody, maybe it was everyone was so starved creatively. I don't know what it was. Yeah. But magic. And this thing came out. And when I, they sent it to me, I was like, you know, I had my hands over my eyes. I'm like, I'm afraid to look at what this is. <laughs> look like. It's spectacular. It looks like it was made in Hollywood. It's so beautiful. And then when I saw the movie, I said to Alexandra, I said, now I can't picture it on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> we got it staged this summer in Cincinnati and it was staged beautifully. But it's it was just one of those. I don't know. It, it all worked out. And it's it's very powerful. It sold out at Cincinnati. They had to extend it. And military families came out in droves to see it mm, so the yeah. the opera house was packed with people who had never been in the opera before it was just thrilling and i think of all the things i've written it's the thing i'm most proud of it's my favorite <laughs> deborah i usually like to wrap up by asking about advice that you've received and given but you are a professor you you teach in the graduate musical theater program at nyu or you just actually retired from that or was it columbia i Either retired way. from columbia you also are in the MFA playwriting program at Columbia. So NYU Columbia, pretty high end teaching gigs here. So I want to actually twist my advice questions to you a little bit. I want to ask you, what are you seeing in your students as they're coming up and claiming this, these art forms? And what do you wish for your students? What do you tell them? What do you hope they hear from you as you are teaching them best you can? Well, I'm seeing... And a lot of this is because of the pandemic. They had to become very self-sufficient, at least in the in musical areas. So the composers had to learn how to demo stuff on their computers. And oh um, yeah. And because of the pandemic, there's been a pivot to a lot of different media. And so, and we've now incorporated that into our curriculum. There, there was a musical web series. They're doing musical. We had a podcast musical. There's uh, short form musicals that are written for film, for YouTube, for they have pivoted to to different media and have embraced that. And I think that's wonderful. And in fact, the rest of us have had to do that, too. I mean, even opera. I even wrote an opera for a web series. It's never happened before. So that was one of the lovely benefits of the the pandemic. And the young the young writers coming up have embraced that fully. So that's great. And what I wish for them, it's it's hard to know what I wish for them because the theater is in such trouble right now. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of them have come into New York to study musical theater writing because they all want to go to Broadway. Who doesn't want to go to Broadway, right? 
Right. That's not likely to happen. What I w- wish for them is that they continue to create their work and allow it to live wherever it lives because art has power wherever it is. And you can have a really brilliant, wonderful career without ever getting to Broadway and touch more people, actually, <laughs> if you work yeah. in communities and in all these different venues that are available than keeping your focus on that Broadway goal. Broadway yeah. has, has become so commercial. And the best work isn't always there. You know what I mean? So I, I hope that they learn to make theater wherever they are and to build a life, a realistic life in the theater can be built if you, you don't have too many stars in your eyes where you become completely impractical and it can be fulfilling and rewarding, right? right? So that's what I wish for them. Well, I want to close up then. Let's uh, put that spotlight back on you, Deborah. Tell everyone listening where they can learn more about you or see your your movie opera or what else you have coming up that they might want to check out. Sure. Well, if you want to see The Knock, it's on YouTube. Just Google The Knock Glimmer Glass and the movie will pop up. It's one hour long. Turn on the subtitles. Uh <laughs> It's opera, it is in English. Right? It is in English, but it is <laughs> opera. So it can. That's yeah, right. Yeah, that's right. I'm excited by that. I have another opera called Murasaki's Moon that I wrote for the Metropolitan Museum of Art and Onsite Opera here in New York. And that's going to be done in an opera company in New Jersey. And I'm going to Japan on tour with Blue Moon over Memphis. And right now I'm just I'm researching and developing different opera proposals with a number of my collaborators. And I, I have a commission I can't speak on it. It was a go, and then it got postponed for a year. So I'm sort of in a holding pattern on that. But this is the first sabbatical I've had in 25 years. So I'm going to travel. I'm traveling. I'm going to going to take a year off and just travel. And oh, and I'm also writing a musical about the loving story, loving versus the state of Virginia, with Deidre oh. Mus- with Deidre Murray. And she grew up in the area where the loving story happened. I am in an interracial marriage. I think there's no two better people to tell that story. So we're hard at work on that. Fantastic. And everyone, yeah, in the show, in the episode summary, I will have links to Deborah's website and to the knock on YouTube. Deborah, best of luck with traveling, well earned, and with <laughs> all that you have going on. And thank you so much for your time and sharing all of this today. Really appreciate it. That was great talking to you, Jason, always. <laughs> You've been listening to the Page and Stage podcast. All my thanks to this week's guest and to all of you out there for listening. You can learn more about all my guests and access their websites and projects in the episode summaries. Send me your thoughts at jason at pageandstage.art. I always love to hear from you, and I'll be featuring your questions on future episodes. This podcast is built with Alitu, the all-in-one podcasting app created by the amazing team over at thepodcasthost.com. Thank you again for listening. And until next time, I'm Jason Cannon, and I cannot wait to hear your story.